Well, this morning we are uh, starting part two of our series on stress, anxiety, and distress. Um, I know stress and distress are almost like the same thing, but it made the acronym SAD, so that's what I went with. So we're starting part two of our series, and, and, and in a way, I almost thought that we should start with this one and then have the one we had last week this week, but I, I think it's good. If you remember, uh, if you were here or if you were able to hear, last week's message was, was basically at its, at its base, it was about giving all of our worries and our stress and our anxiety, our distress, giving those over to God. And not just once and done, because the reality is that that's not how worry works for us. We don't just worry about one thing once, and then we say, okay, here, God, you have it, and then we're done with it. I, I, I wish it was like that. And, and sometimes, sometimes it works out that way. But for me, and I imagine for many of you, um, those worries come right back in. And if not those exact worries, then something similar in a different place or whatever. And, and so we need to discipline ourselves to give those worries over to God on a regular basis. And I encourage you uh, strongly to participate, to, to practice breath prayers, to pray without ceasing, as Paul says, and, and to do so by you know, praying a simple phrase or a Bible passage or whatever, the one that I use being uh, most often, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, have mercy on Gwyneth. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, have mercy on Canada, etc. Right? That is my favorite. You don't, incidentally, I don't know if I said this last week, you do not have to beat yourself up if you forget to do a breath prayer. It's not like, okay, you didn't do your breath prayer for the last 10 breaths, so you're going to be kicked out of the kingdom of heaven. That's not how this is. This is, a, this is a spiritual discipline that can help you grow and help you be with God all the time in a conscious way. Um, but if, if you forget, well, that's fine. You just remember when you remember, and then you start again. And the more you do it, uh, the more regular it will become for you, but you certainly don't need to uh, bemoan your fate if you have forgotten. It's not that kind of thing. <clears throat> not that really you should be doing that anyways. All right, so this week we are looking at uh, why it is true, really, that giving all of those cares and worries over, over to God is actually a legitimate thing to do. Now, that may seem like a, a no-brainer, like giving cares and concerns to God. Well, God is bigger than me. God is more powerful than me. God is you know, omnipotent and omniscient, and he is able to be everywhere at once, omnipresent. And, and so, of course, it makes sense to give my worries to the big guy, to the one who has the power to do something about it. But, but really, ultimately, that is not the key, the linchpin, the reason why we give our, our prayers and our worries to God. And, and that the linchpin lies in uh, to whom we belong. And so we are going to look briefly at Lord's Day, uh, Lord's Day question and answer uh, one from the Heidelberg Catechism, with which you are no doubt familiar. But I want you to pay a special attention to that word comfort. And just let it rattle around in your brain and in your heart and in your soul as we carry on through this message. So for those of you who aren't aware or don't remember, um, which is probably very few in this particular room, but uh, you never know. Uh, the Heidelberg Catechism was a document that was written in uh, the 1500s. It was written as kind of a frequently asked questions for new believers. Um, catechism, and we just talked about this as a family a little while ago, 
catechism um, has Latin roots or something, uh, Greek roots, Greek, thank you, and um, it goes together with words like catechesis and catechumen and catechetical, uh, which is actually a word. Um, <coughs> so uh, in the early church days, a catechumen was somebody, a person who was studying to learn the basics of the faith so that they could do their, uh, their baptism or their profession of faith, whatever was going on in their particular church at the time, mostly baptisms because people had had kids who were believers yet at that point in some cases. Anyways, so you were looking at uh, people who are being educated. So a catechumen is someone who is studying to learn the basics of the faith. And a catechism is a document that contains a lot of the basic answers that will help educate the person. Catechesis is the, um, the act of teaching someone about the faith. So um, if I am teaching catechism, then I am doing catechesis, right? Um, and then catechetical is, you know, having to do with that process of teaching and so on, right? So the Heidelberg Catechism was frequently asked questions for believers, uh, especially in the <clears throat> newly reformed churches. It's called the Heidelberg because it was written in Heidelberg, uh, Germany. Um, and so it is uh, a document that we, we love in this denomination and uh, that we believe teaches, summarizes a, a lot of the essentials of our Christian faith. So the first question and answer is absolutely key. It sets the stage for everything that comes after. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Let's say the answer together. That I am not my own but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. We're going to look at a couple of particular passages. One of the nice things about the versions of the Heidelberg Catechism that most of us are familiar with is that they often include scripture references, which is really neat because uh, really scripture is number one. The catechism and other documents are number two, okay? They're, they're wonderful, they're good, but they must be measured against the scriptures. If all you know is the Heidelberg Catechism, you're in trouble. I may have shared this with you before, but Gwyneth grew up in the Baptist church. I know I've shared that with you before. But she also went to a, a Christian school with me uh, that was largely filled up with Dutch descent uh, Christian reform folk. And one of the things that would drive her nuts was that she'd get into some theological debate with somebody and they would quote at her the Heidelberg Catechism. And she'd say, yeah, but what does the Bible say? Probably not with that attitude, but <laughs> yeah, maybe, right? Uh, because the reality is, is that the Heidelberg Catechism is designed to point to the scriptures. It doesn't replace the scriptures. So, we look at the Heidelberg Catechism, we say, ooh, that's cool, that's really neat. But now we look at the scriptures. In particular, today, we are going to look at two of the passages that back up this question and answer. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verses 
29 to <coughs> 31. Matthew 29 verses, or Matthew 10, 29 to 31, which says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The second passage that we're going to look at is John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verses 27 and following. John chapter 10, verses 27. Now this is in the context of, of Jesus Jesus is making clear in this particular section of the Gospel of John that he and the Father are one. Jesus makes several I am statements. And, and I am statements are significant because God, the Father, when talking with Moses, and, and Moses asked him, who shall I say sent me? God names himself as I. I am, right? And so when Jesus has, according to the Pharisees, the nerve and the gall to say, I am, in the particular way that he does, he is claiming not only that he is the Son of God, but that he is together, one with God in divinity. And so this is a this is a pretty pivotal point in Jesus' ministry on earth. But <clears throat> in John, 1, or John 10, verse 27, we read, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, there's obviously a couple of critical things here. One is that we want to remind ourselves of that concept of comfort, right? Right? Because the reality is, is that this world is full of trouble. And, and even if we, we shut out the world and only look to ourselves, the truth is, is that I myself am full of trouble. I myself, even in my own little world, in my own body, in my own mind, in my own heart, I am full of trouble, and so are you. Even if mentally you are a happy-go-lucky person and you've never been sad in your life and, and stuff like this, your body's going to break down, you're going to die, you are going to not be able to do the things that you used to be able to do, your mind will stop working the way it once did, right? Right? Even within ourselves, we are full of trouble. But of course, we're not just within ourselves. We are living in this world, more broadly speaking, and this world is full of trouble. We have struggles all over the place. Just look at what was going on in Haiti. Just look at the election that has come upon us and all of the issues surrounding it. Part of the reason, if you think about this, part of the reason that we have different political parties is that there are troubles in this world and different people have different solutions to those troubles. If there was only one solution, really legitimately only one solution, to the world's problems in detail, then there probably wouldn't be any political parties. You know? One party says we ought to fix things this way. Another party says we ought to fix things this other way. 
we have trouble in this world. You look at the pandemic, and it is trouble. It is trouble in a whole bunch of ways. It is trouble, of course, for the people who get it. It is trouble, of course, for the people who have to do the health care and care for the people who get it. It is trouble for the countries where they have vastly fewer number of vaccines available to them than we do. It is trouble as, as it develops into different variants. It is trouble as it plays with our minds. It is trouble as it messes up our social structures. It is trouble as it, as it seems to lead people in desperation to resort to things like opioids and other drugs. It is trouble when it comes to employment and the economy. It is trouble even for how we feel towards each other. There's a lot of trouble in this world. And so human beings, being in a lot of trouble is sort of, it's normal. And worse than that, the reality is, is that the trouble is really of our own making. We brought this upon ourselves. I'm not saying that COVID is, is somebody's punishment for some particular sin or set of sins. <coughs> I'm not saying that political parties are a punishment for our sins, although sometimes it feels that way, right? I, I'm not saying that, that polarization is necessarily your punishment for your opinionated stances or something like that, not excluding myself. But what I'm saying is, and what the Bible says, is that trouble, capital T, was brought into this world when Adam and Eve decided to rebel against their Lord and God. And each of us has inherited that, and each of us has acted upon that in the same basic way. And so trouble is what we have, a lot of it. And so apart from God, really, worry and anxiety and stress and distress are, are kind of the only reasonable response. Either that or, or, or becoming a sociopath, right? If you can really legitimately bring yourself to the place where you actually don't care about anyone or anything except yourself, I suppose you could carry on through life quite happily. But if you do care, then you're going to worry, apart from God. And this is where the key comes in. Because God changes everything. Apart from God, there is pretty much nothing but worry. With God, there is hope for a future. There is hope for today. There is good news, and there is ultimate final triumph. <coughs> and not only that, but because of God, we can rest assured each and every day. Why? Why? Because God is who God is, and we are who we are in relation to God through Jesus Christ. Right? This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Brothers and sisters, you, you, are worth more than many sparrows. 
You are worth so much, in fact, that God himself would deign to become one of his creation. God, for you, made himself in Jesus Christ a human being. But not only that, not only did God lower himself, emptying himself of everything but love, God began that life as a baby and born of the Virgin Mary. And he, he walked among us and talked with us and he experienced all the things that we experience except without sinning. And then he died for us. He threw open his arms, as the saying is, and he died for us. You are worth more. Right? So in this little passage in Matthew, we see two key things. One is that you are worth more than many sparrows, and the other is that God knows you infinitely and intimately. Right? God has counted all the hairs on your head. That's easier for me than it is for some of you, but nonetheless, he knows them all. And not one of them can fall from your head without his will. Now that doesn't mean that he is going to, you know, keep you in a little bubble wrapped up tightly so that you never experience any trouble. No. What it means is that he is able and willing and will bring you through the trouble with his sovereign authority and grace and his promise that he will do all things for the good of those who love him. He will turn all things to the good for those who love him. I love sparrows and, and animals and little critters and creatures and stuff. I'm a softie like that. I kind of wish, you know, the story of Dr. Doolittle or whatever who could talk to animals, right? That's Dr. Doolittle, right? I so wish I was that guy. I want to be able to talk to the animals. But God can, and he sees them, and <clears throat> forgive me for being all, you know, sentimental or whatever, but he sees the cute bunnies, and he sees the cute little kitties and the birdies, and he sees all the wonderful little animals, and they're wonderful, and he even sees the ugly animals, or the ones that we think are ugly, and, and he loves them, and he cares for them, and not even one of them can fall without his will. And yet he sees us. And we're even more to him. And that is beautiful. It's wonderful. But then that's not all, of course. Then we look at John chapter 10, and we realize that not only can we not fall without the, without the will of the Lord our God in heaven, but we also find out that we have a promise that is great, that has given, been given to us. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voices, John 10, 27. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, it, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Nothing bad can happen to us without the will of the Lord our God. But not only that, anything that feels or seems bad to us will be worked to the good of those who love him. And not only that, but there is nothing that can take you away from God and from the gift that he has given you of eternal life. Nothing. Right? 
You are secure in his hand. And this is why, this is why our only comfort, comfort in life and in death is that we belong to Jesus. Nothing bad will happen without his will. Everything that seems bad will be worked for the good of those who love him. And nothing can ever snatch us from his hands. And he gives us the gift of eternal life. And so really when it comes down to it, what do we have to be afraid of? Yes, this world is full of trouble, but compared to our God, it is nothing. Yes, there is trouble within our bodies. We are already saved and made holy by God through Jesus Christ, but we are not yet what we will be when we are resurrected on that great and glorious day with our new and glorified bodies just like Jesus has, who is the firstborn of the dead. Yes, it is true that this body will die this body will decay. This body already has aches and pains. But it is nothing compared to our God and his plan for us. So our only comfort in life and in death is not that we have a good, secure job. Our only comfort in life and in death is not that we have good, strong bodies that can do tremendous things or that we have sharp minds that can figure out the solutions to problems. Our only comfort in life and in death is not whether, you know, we might be tempted to think it might be, but our, our only comfort in life and in death is not our husbands or our wives. It is not our community. It is not our friends. It is not our family. Our only only comfort in life and in death is not our government or our country. Our only comfort in life and in death is none of those things. Our only comfort in life and in death is that we belong to Jesus Christ. And that is why it is so critical, so important to continue to practice the presence of God in our everyday, every moment life. Because as we often do, we forget that our only comfort is that we belong to Jesus. And we walk around pretending like we got it covered, we've got it in our control, we've got it figured out, or we walk around like everything is falling apart and this world is a disaster and I'm going to die. Neither of which is true. I mean, you are going to die, but that's not ultimately a bad thing, in a way. <clears throat> right? So if you say all the time, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, or whatever phrase you choose with each and every breath, then you are reminding yourself that Jesus is your comfort. You are reminding yourself that you are even now, right now, in the presence of God. You are reminding yourself of who God is and who you are in relation to him. And your worries and your stress and your anxiety and your distress, they will chances are really good, not disappear instantaneously for the rest of your life so that you never worry about anything again. But as you discipline yourself, as we discipline ourselves to time and time again, give those over to God. This second, the next second, the second after that, give them over to God each and every moment of every day for the rest of our lives. And as 
we do that, then as the song sings, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So brothers and sisters, never forget your comfort. Never forget that you belong to our Lord, Jesus Christ, who has bought us with his precious blood. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your son, for you, O oh God, you who knows the hairs on our heads, you who loves the sparrow and who will not let it fall without your will. Thank you, O oh God, that we are your sheep and that we can listen to your voice and follow you. Thank you for giving us eternal life. Thank you for the security that we belong to you. O oh God, may the worries of this world fade away as we rely more and more on you. Help us to practice your presence always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.